Year's yet. People are telling me Happy New Year's, and I'm smiling at you. Why? Because it's not there yet. <laughs> we didn't get there yet. At midnight tonight, Happy New Year. <laughs> Next Sunday morning, I'll say it to you and invite you to tell everybody else the same message, but I'm still working on last year. Why? Because there's some cleanup to be done. There's some things that need to be tidied up, some bows that need to be tied, some trash that needs to go out, a life that needs to be prepared for a brand new year. And I've been talking to people, and I've been walking with leaders and other believers, and I hear things like, I feel tired, I'm discouraged, I'm ready to quit. I just feel like I'm going through the motions, but nothing's going on. Okay? And so you want to walk through the gate into 2023 there? Or shall we make some adjustments? Well, you got this afternoon, and you have this evening. Let's make those adjustments. Because as I listen to the stories of others and look at my own heart with its struggles, one conclusion that I come to is that one of the most common causes of frustration and discouragement in you and in me is simply this, misplaced priorities misplaced priorities. With the push and shove of the 21st century, we end up being bullied into majoring on minors. We waste our energy on urgent secondary issues. We get coerced into doing what everybody else wants or feel compelled to be whatever they need us to be instead of stopping for just a moment and understanding what God wants from me. Why? If you're a believer in Jesus, you serve before an audience of one, and it's not me. Because when it's all over, I'm not going to be the one chatting with you. You will stand before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and he will ask some hard questions to which you will answer with all the integrity in your heart because he knows when you lie to him. And you will tell him exactly what you did and what you said and what you thought and what you felt. And so why don't we start there today? It's no wonder to me that you and I are tired and often lukewarm towards God because the things that are eternal, that will outlast this life, get crowded out by the constant overwhelming desires and demands of society and culture. A few years ago, my partner focused on a couple of verses for an entire year. One of them was this one. Let me put it up for you. I got it from the Amplified Bible, which sometimes takes the Greek language and other things and adds things in that are there, but if you're going to do a nice smooth translation, if you're looking at yours, it won't look like this, but have a look at it with me. I was going to put it on paper for you, and then I decided not to, so follow along with me. And do not be conformed to this world, fashioned after and adapted to its external and superficial customs, but be transformed, changed by the entire renewal of your mind by its new ideals, its new attitudes as you mature spiritually so that you may prove for yourselves what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God, even the thing which is good and acceptable and perfect in his plan and his purpose for you. So Phillips, J.B. Phillips sat down with those verses and did this translation. Have a look at it with me. With eyes wide open to the mercies of God, I beg you, my brothers and sisters, as an act of intelligent worship, to give him your bodies. As you stand on the cusp of a new year, that's what I'm telling you. As a living sacrifice, consecrated or dedicated to him and acceptable by him. Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold. 
but let God remold your minds from within so that you may prove in practice that the plan of God for you is good, meets all his demands, and moves you towards the goal of true maturity. The reason I chose to talk about this issue of misplaced priorities is because I have a sneaking suspicion that, like me, you've got your world and the pressures and the pushing that you've endured. And so this morning, before we step into 2024, you, like me, this past week and this afternoon yet, need to push pause on life for just a minute and check that everything's back in alignment when you walk into 2024. You see, when I get out of alignment with God's design, it drags me down. It causes me unnecessary fatigue and frustration. Today, many followers of Jesus, good, honest, Bible-believing people, are giving first-class allegiance to second-class causes. Those causes, whether they are personal or cultural or political or social, are ultimately going to disenchant and disillusion you. And so the Apostle Paul comes at you again with these words, don't live the way the world lives. Don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. I want to talk today and look at God in God's word is a concern that what I want to look at is a concern that requires my attention periodically this morning. The question is one of course correction. This morning is an appeal that must come regularly to the heart and life of every genuine laborer for Christ and his kingdom. And it is simply this. How is God's word pushing back against my current direction, focus, priorities, and purposes? Is the pushback you're getting the devil or is it the Lord? Because I've had people tell me, it's the devil. And I could see that it, he had nothing to do with this. I'll show you one of those in a few minutes. But we'll get there. Now let rem me remind you of the three facts of life. Are you ready for the three facts of life? Three facts of life. Here they come. I can't do it all. Number two, God does not expect me to do it all. And all God's people said... Oh, thank God. Number three, there are comparatively few things he deems worth doing. So if you're overwhelmed this morning, I need you to ask this question. Who put this load on my back? Who put this load on my back? Because I can't do it all. And God doesn't expect me to do it all. In fact, his list of priorities for me is relatively small. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. Let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. You say, how am I supposed to do that? Well, there are two rails in life. I'm old enough to remember the railroad, and I'm not European. <laughs> I was born in the dusty plains of southern Saskatchewan, flat as a pancake. You stand on a molehill, and you think you can see just about to China. Two rails. What are the two rails, Pastor? Pastor? Two rails that God has for you. Number one is the new commandment for transformation. The new commandment, I'll get you. Just patience. Here's the other one is the new commission. It deals with testimony. The new commandment, oh, that's easy. Here you go. A new commandment. This is Jesus now. I'm not telling you this stuff. I'm not making this up, okay? Just so you and I are on the same page. 
A new commandment I give to you that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. That's the call for transformation. Can you see that in there? Now watch this. By this all people will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. There's the second call. It's to what? Testimony. Two rails. Transformation and testimony. That's the new commandment. Here's the great commission or the new commission. Here we go. Come on. And Jesus said to them, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. I am the boss, period. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. What's he talking about? I gave it to you. Testimony. Go everywhere and tell everybody. What are you going to tell them? Well, you're going to teach them to observe all that I've commanded you. We're talking about transformation now. A good teacher teaches two ways. Number one, he teaches by laying out the process and understanding the issues. The second way he teaches is by life. And Jesus told the 12 disciples, I want you to go and testify to what has happened to you. The second thing I need you to do is to show everybody else and tell everybody else what I commanded you. And I'll tell you what, I'll stick with you until it's over. You say, who does that? Oh, two people, three people. Oh, well, let me give you one. The Apostle Paul writes these words, however, I consider myself of no great value to me so that I may finish my race in the ministry I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of grace. Notice there are two things first here in his task. His first task was to finish my race. The second thing he was given, he says, is the ministry that he received from the Lord Jesus. You say, well, what's the race? Well, let's read a little bit, shall we? Philippians chapter 3, I'm going to start at verse 8. I'll put it all on the screen for you so you can follow with me. But even more than that, I can figure, consider everything a loss because of what is worth far more, knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. He's just finished talking in the context about his past. He's got an education bar none. He's from one of the families. He's got status coming out his wazoo. He goes anywhere and because of his education, his status, and his family's standing, and all those other nice little buttons, he is somebody in the culture. And he says as he begins this that he considers everything of that to be a loss. What everybody else is fighting for, for finances, status in culture, and a place to stand where everybody looks up at you. He said that's a loss. Why? Well, because of what is worth far more, knowing Jesus Christ my Lord. For his sake, I have lost all things and consider them rubbish so that I may gain Christ. I want a relationship with Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness or a right standing of my own because of who I am and what I did. But the kind of right standing that comes from faith in Christ Jesus, the righteousness that comes through God by faith. He said, listen, this is where I'm going. I do this so that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death in the hope that in some way I may arrive at the resurrection from the dead. Paul says, listen, I don't want this just to be a matter of stuff in my head. Look at this. He said, I want to know him in the power of his resurrection. You know he got stoned. Rocks, not drugs, by the way. And they left him for dead. And the fellowship of his sufferings, oh, he knew all about that. 
being conformed to his death in the hope that in some way I may arrive where he did at the resurrection from the dead. Paul, but you know him. He said, no, you don't understand, but I want to know him. Yeah, but Paul, you've got the intellectual capacity and the experience. He said, you don't understand. I'm not there yet. In fact, he goes on to say, not that I have already obtained this. What is this? Christ's likeness. I haven't got there yet. Or I've reached the goal. Here's the race I'm running. I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took a hold of me. What was that? First T, transformation. I want to be a different person. I want to be the person that when God looked at me in my mother's womb, he said, I got plans for you. I got things for you to do. I got a future for you, not only in this life, but in the life that is to come. And I am ready to do this. Paul said, I'm all in. Brothers, I don't consider myself to have taken hold of it yet, but this one thing I do, forgetting all the stuff that's behind me and straining towards the things that are ahead, I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. What was that? Becoming like Jesus. In a word, transformation. That was the race he was in. So what was the ministry he received? Oh, the ministry he received is right there to testify. Oh, wait a minute. Transformation and what? Testimony. To testify to the gospel of God's grace. And what does he say? At the end of his life, in his final letter to a friend by the name of Timothy, he writes these words. I fought the good fight. The Bible says in Revelation, and they overcame him. That is the devil. By the blood of the lamb. And what? The word of their testimony. Paul said... I fought the good fight, I testified, and I finished the course. Everything that I could do, everything that I could yield to for the transforming power of God has been done. And by the way, through it all, I kept the faith. I want to be able to say that at the conclusion of my life that I finished the race towards Christ's likeness, I completed the ministry you gave me to do. I want new creation, transformation within to be reflected in my life and lifestyle on the outside. I want to be prepared to share the testimony of the source of the power for transformation and be changed and be allowed to share with everyone that God opens the door to me for. that they too may come to a saving knowledge of Christ. And that's why I want to talk to you today about realigning your core priorities. Why? Because there's only two. Transformation and testimony. Transformation and testimony. Paul refused to be distracted from what mattered most. He kept on track with his purpose and his priorities. He fought for them all throughout his life. And if you want your life to count like I want my life to count, if you want your ministry, your service for God, whatever that is, wherever it takes place to make a difference, the starting point is to clarify what matters most in your life and then reorder everything else around it. There's another thing, priorities and purposes matter. Many years ago, one of the largest American denominations ran a conference. The theme was the highest power for the greatest task. One of the speaker's words caught my attention. 
Fortunately, they published those things. Here's what he said. I realize we only engage the highest power when we are doing the greatest task. God is not obligated to empower or energize us to do our own thing. Did you hear that? God has no obligation to equip us or empower us to accomplish our self-made to-do list. Read bucket list. He empowers his people to achieve his purposes and plans, not ours. That threw me for a loop. Because surely God only wanted whatever I wanted. Surely God can see what I can see and know. So, hey, 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 I like, hey, this is what's important to me. God said, you matter to me. But I planned every day of your life and gave you an allotted time span to get some things done. And the life I plan for you is so far beyond what you can imagine. You need to stay aligned with me. So I need to align my life if I'm looking for a happy new year. Three things I think we need to do this morning. Can I pray with you and get started on them quickly? Let's do it. Father, work in our hearts today we pray. Show us your way. We want the transformation. And God, we need to be people with a testimony. In Jesus' name, amen. Realigning for the for happy new year. First thing I have to do then is I have to adopt God's agenda. Adopt God's agenda. What is God's agenda in the world? Well, God's agenda is not economic. It's not an entertainment agenda. It's not a political agenda. It's not trying to save an ethnic group or a nation or the whales or anything else. God is not an ethnic or a national deity. God's agenda is to create or populate what the Bible calls the kingdom of God. Simply put, God wanted a family. And he has been building a family ever since he decided that's what he wanted. He's building a redeemed kingdom of God because when he started us on this planet, we blew him off and said, we're smarter than you and we're going to do this our way. And he said, listen, this is a horrific mistake. But you have the right to choose, so choose. But I'm going to give you another option that will step back into the purposes and plans that I have for you, that will give you the opportunity to realign yourself with the direction that I always hoped you would go for the best life you could ever hope for. Jesus said these words as he began preaching the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is near. What did he say? Repent. Repent is a 180 degree turn from your way to his way. Turn around and believe the good news that God has sent. Somebody asked me the other day, he said, you know, preacher, when is it all going to end? Oh, I can tell you that. You can? Oh, of course. I know exactly when it's all going to end. You do. Could I have a date, please? Oh, I don't have one of those for you. But I can tell you when. It's found in the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 24 and verse 14. The, the words of Jesus, and he said this, and this Gospel of the Kingdom will be preached or declared throughout the whole inhabited earth as a, there's the word, testimony to all the nations. And it doesn't say nations, it actually says ethnos, to every ethnic group. And there are groups we haven't reached yet. To all nations, and then what will happen? Then it'll be the end. It's not just a matter of reaching everyone in Canada 
or in some other country. Circle the word all. God cares about all peoples. He doesn't care anymore about one than he cares for another. Jesus died for the whole world, not one brand or band of people. Jesus said the end comes when everybody's had a chance to hear. So here's what I know. History is moving toward a climax, and he said the end is not going to come until everybody God wants to hear has had opportunity to hear. You can debate Bible prophecy. Show me your charts and maps. Those are very interesting. I've spent hours with them myself. You can watch the news every night with your Bible open. But here's what I'm going to tell you. Jesus isn't coming because you can read the signs. He's coming because somebody testified. To the transforming power of God in their life. And when the last word of testimony has been shared, then will the end come, chart or no chart. It's over. Now the kingdom of God is a major theme in Jesus' ministry. And the kingdom is used 157 times in the New Testament. Did you know that? Kingdom was Jesus' favorite description of what God is doing in the world in preparation for the next. The next what? The next world, of course. You know that, right? And no. It's what Jesus cared about more than anything else. That is his agenda, building this kingdom of God, not building my career or my status, not building my country or my business, but building the kingdom of God. You say, well, preacher, what does the kingdom of God look like right now? Well, let me tell you what it looks like. People from every tribe, tongue, and nation who choose to submit wholeheartedly to the lordship of Jesus Christ who are consciously working to fulfill God's purposes through their lives on this planet. Why? Because if they'll get transformed and testify, then will come what? The end. The kingdom of God is a people. It is not a nationality. People have citizenship in the kingdom of God from everywhere and if not yet from everywhere that's part of the holdup the current shape of the kingdom of god in the world is made up of people who have 100 percent bought into the fact that god has a life for them now they are going to fulfill his purpose because that fulfilling his purpose for them will transform them into the people he intended them to be prepare them for the world that is yet to come and get them set up for a life beyond their wildest dreams here's the bottom line you want to know what matters to god people matter The old preacher said to me, son, you can't take it with you. There's only one thing you can take with you, he told me. People. You can't take your bank account, but you can take your family. Does that matter to you? You can't take your Cadillac, but you can take your co-worker. Hello? You can take the gal who lives next door and the guy who's up the street to check in, you know, tell her at the counter. You can help, you can, you can, he'll take anybody because all that matters to God is what? People. It's all that's ever mattered to him. He wants to transform them, to make them new, to realign them with himself. He's got a purpose and a plan in this life that stretches beyond this life. And the only way people get transformed and prepared is that other people who already know do what? Testify. That's the word. And if you are going to realign yourself for 2024, there's only two things that matter. 
that you're being daily transformed into the image of Christ, that people can see that God is reshaping you into the person he always dreamed you could be. And that you, at every opportunity that you are given, share that good news with other people because people matter to God. You see, God is after me to realign for a brand new year. So don't overlook the obvious here, friends, with God. One day is as good as a thousand years and a thousand years a day. God isn't late with showing up. God promised 2,000 years ago he was going to come. He's not here yet. Why is he late? God's not late. Read the rest. He is restraining himself. Why? On account of you. Holding back the end because he does not want anyone left out or lost. He is giving everyone space and time to change. But make no mistake about it. That day will come. But when the day of God's judgment finally does come, Peter continues, it will be unannounced like a thief. The sky will collapse with a thunderous roar, everything disintegrating in a raging inferno. And the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. And he will destroy the ball that you're walking on. And then he'll start again. With you. The Bible says he's holding back to the end because he doesn't want anyone to be lost. He's waiting for you and I to testify. He's waiting for you and I to experience the transformation that he wants us to know. He wants everybody that wants to come in his kingdom, and he's determined that everybody should have that opportunity. That, my friends, is God's agenda. How much does God care? Listen to me. This is how much God loved the world. He gave his son, his one and only son, and this is why. So no one need to be destroyed. By believing in him, anyone can have a whole and lasting or eternal life. You can live beyond this life. God didn't go to all the trouble of sending Jesus to point an accusing finger and tell the world how bad it was. He came to help. Do you understand that? He came to help to put the world right again. You see, so then anyone who trusts in him is acquitted. Anyone who refuses to trust in him has long since been under the sentence of death without knowing it. And why? Because of that person's failure to believe in a one-of-a-kind son of God when introduced. Why are people going to hell this morning? Number one, two reasons. Number one, nobody told them there was another way. Number two, because they decided to. And God says everybody should have that choice. That's how much people matter to God. Does it matter to you? Should. Because here's what it's going to look like when it's all over. God said, I can not only see today, I can see tomorrow. And I'm going to tell you what tomorrow looks like. Let me let you in. He parts the curtains. Here's what he said. They're singing a new song to Jesus. You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were killed. At the cost of your own blood, you have purchased for God persons from every tribe, language, people, and nation. And you have appointed them as a kingdom and priests to serve our God. And they will reign when he retrofits the planet. God's kingdom is multinational. Every language, people, nation, tribe, tongue. That's God's agenda. What's number two, preacher? Well, in order to adopt God's agenda, you've got to abandon the distractions. 
The secret of effective life in one word is focus. Let me tell you a story. Let's read it. Here we go. Here, let me tell you what's happening. Israel, no, Judah has done bad. I mean really bad. So God destroyed their nation. Okay? And let the grass grow over the fields for 70 years. At the end of 70 years, he gathers a group of people from that nation back together and says, I'm going to replant you. Here's all I need you to do. You can get yourself set up, but here's what I want you to do. I want you to establish a house for me. That's what I want. Are we clear? Yep. So I'll get you home, and you build the house. Deal? And they packed their wagons from wherever they were in the Assyrian and Babylonian territory and headed home. In the second year of Darius, Haggai chapter 1 verse 1 that's not on the screen reads, On the first day of the sixth month, the word came to the prophet, to the governor, and to the high priest. Verse 2 on the screen. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. And the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it time for you to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. But that's not all he said. He said, here's the deal. You have planted much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You put on clothes, but you're not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. That sounds familiar. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Think about that. Is he done? Oh, no, he's not done yet. He said, so here's the deal. Go up into the mountains and bring down the timber and build my house so that I may take pleasure and be honored, says the Lord. Here, look it. He said, you expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. You mean it wasn't the devil? You mean it's not just bad financial management? No. God said, I blew you off because that's what you did to me. Oh, God does that. Well, you read it. You expected little. See it uh, much turned. See it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why? Because my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with your own. You're busy building your security for the future. You're busy talking about how you're going to climb the ladder. You're busy worrying about a whole bunch of other things in your little political domicile. Who's going to run this place and how are they going to do this right? And God said, and I'm blowing it off. Why? He said, I told you. You can get together. I can arrange for everything to come together for you. Here's the one thing I want. What do I want? I want you to build my house. Hmm. Therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew and the earth its crops. I called for the drought, God said, on the fields, the mountains, the grain, the new wine, the all, everything else the ground produces, people, livestock, and on all the labor of your hands, you're working hard and you're not getting anywhere. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Do what? Time for a realignment, I'd say. What do you think? God says, think about where you're at and what's going on. Luke chapter 6, verse 45, Jesus sits down with his disciples one day and says these words, a good person from the good things in his heart produces good. An evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. What you say flows from what is in your heart. So let me ask you this. He said, why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, and then don't do what I tell you? (laughs) 
He says, you're welcome to call me Lord because I am. And you call on me in desperation and say, I gotta have some help here. We need some change here. We need some stuff to happen. He says, but I gave you some simple instructions. Why don't you do what I say? You see, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses, people who've gone on before us, who've believed God and walked with God, witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down and the sin that so easily trips us up. There's stuff in your life that is a problem, as there is in mine. Yeah, there's the sin that so easily trips us up, but notice, too, there's some stuff that's not sin. Well, pastor, that's not sin. Okay, but is it helping you? The Bible says to strip off every weight that slow down and run with endurance, what? The race God has set before us. There are sins and there are distractions. Are you focused on God's agenda of transformation and testimony? Have you ever thought why God keeps you alive after he redeems you, after you're saved and you get baptized? Why didn't God just kill you and take you to heaven? I mean, if you were made for eternity, why does he make you stay here? Well, God has five purposes for your life. Five purposes. Let me show you quickly. You know these. Worship, fellowship, discipleship, ministry, and evangelism. God wants you to worship him. That is to submit your entire life to him and his program. He wants you to fellowship. He wants you to talk to other people and become part of the family of God because he's always wanted a family. You notice family doesn't always get along. Uh, discipleship. God says, I want you to learn to walk the way that I need you to walk so that we can have a future together. That's called discipleship. Ministry. Once you've figured out what it is I need you to do, I want you to, why don't you just do it? And finally, he said evangelism. Then I need you to tell people about what has happened in the life that I gave you. Since I transformed your life and started to spin things around and you started listening to me and seeing change happen. You know, you can do uh, three out of five in heaven. Which ones can you do in heaven? Well, you can worship, that's for sure. You can still submit to the will and design of God and praise his name in song. You could fellowship together, yeah, because there'll be other people there. The Bible says that when we get there, though, we shall see him and we shall be what? Oh, like him. So that one's done. Ministry. Can you serve God for all eternity? Oh, okay, so that one's on. Evangelism. Can you do that? No. Why? Because that's all finished. What are the two things that you can only do here that, he ma that matter to him? You see, as a tree falls, so shall it lie. The way you get out of here is the way you go in there. Only the, what's in you that's Jesus survives the transition. The other stuff he doesn't want there because that's what's causing all the trouble here. You will be as much like Jesus as you can be before you leave. Paul said he'd finish the race. And he testified to non-believers about the gospel. Transformation and testimony, that was Paul. Interesting, Jesus is a boy, 12 years old. First words of Jesus, do you know what they are? In the Bible, or in Luke's gospel, he says this. He's lost his parents for three days, and they are really frustrated with him. As you can well imagine, being a parent losing a child in a large... You're a 12-year-old young person, and you get lost in New York City. And your parents think you're with them. In the entourage, you know, and you're not. It takes them three days to find you. Are they happy? Mary and Joseph were not happy. <laughs> And they found him. And he said, what are you putting us through? What is going on with you? First words of Jesus, what were they? I must be about my father's business. 
In John chapter 17, he's praying his final prayer before he heads with the disciples to Gethsemane. Verse number two, he says these words. I finished everything you gave me to do. Bookend. He started out doing what? Father's business. And he finished and said, I finished. Paul said, I got started on this race and I got this ministry. And when he wrapped it all up in first, Second Timothy, he said, I fought the good fight. I did what? Finished the course. And through it all, I kept the faith. Testimony and transformation. Don't get distracted by the other stuff. Jesus taught us to pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because it's frequently not done here. So that's why we're praying that at least we align ourselves with the program. The disciples were in a very bad state. They're in an oppressed nation. I don't know if you understand where Jesus is. He doesn't live in America. He does not live in Canada. If anybody makes it out like that, first thing you do is ignore what they say in that regard. That's the truth. Jesus lived under oppression. They were taxing the life out of the people, taking away everything. The bulk of the population is in abject poverty. They're under the thumbs of the Roman government. They have no freedom. Don't yell at me about freedom. They have no freedom, no liberty. All their movements are watched and carefully perused by everybody and everything that's going on. That's how life was for Jesus. And they're worried because they got families to feed and life to do. And into that moment, Jesus walks and says these words, now frame it. I framed it, now let's look at it. So don't worry, saying, what will we eat? What will we drink or what will we wear? For the unbelievers chase after these things. Certainly your heavenly father knows you need these things. So here's what I need you to do, he said. Here's what I need you to do. It's circled in red. What? First. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Right standing, alignment with the plans and purposes of God. Oh, and BTW, all these other things will be taken care of. Jesus is looking at me to say this morning and asking, why are you striving? I promised that if you'd put me first, I'd take care of the rest. Whoa. So how do I avoid being spiritually distracted? Here you go, fast. Pray and ask the Lord to guard your heart from spiritual distractions. Second, study the scriptures and apply the truths of God to your life. Let that transformation happen, friends. Gather regularly with other believers and encourage one another. Because we do get down on occasion, you know. Then consider God's word and ask the Holy Spirit to help you. This is today's job, by the way, this one. Like, get your camera out, click. Consider God's word and ask the Holy Spirit to help you correctly assess your, it should say, there, there's my mistake, your own spiritual state and yield your mind and personal habits to be what? Transformed for the purpose of testimony. How are you going to do all that? I can't do all that, preacher. <laughs> well, you got to access God's power. Jesus is with his disciples, and they're upset that life is still the way that it was. They're still being oppressed. He's risen from the dead. He's been around for 40 days. And they said, listen, Jesus, we're waiting for the change. Like, we want you to just turn this political, social, and economic system around. Like, when are you going to fix it? You, do you want the answer? Oh, I'll give it to you anyway. He said to them, and it's not for you to know. <laughs> there you go. It's, there you go. It's not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority. 
But here's the deal. Let me tell you what, what matters to you. You'll receive power when the Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses. You will testify to the transforming power of Jesus Christ. In Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth. Friends, God is always looking for people to faithfully serve his kingdom, locally and internationally. For the eyes of the Lord, the prophet told King Asa, the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen. Did you see that? Those whose hearts are fully committed to him. You want strength? You need some endurance? You're tired? Let me put it to you another way, because here's another uh, translation of the same verse. The Lord searches all the earth for people who have given themselves completely to him. He wants to make them strong. Do you need to be strong? Then you need to adopt God's agenda, ditch the distractions, and get access to his power. Now, there's four responses you can give me to what I said this morning. You can be like Moses. When God called him, he said, who, me? I mean, me? Or you can be Jonah. (laughs) Not me. (laughs) Not me. You can be like the prophet Habakkuk and said, why me? Why me? Why? (laughs) Or you can be like the prophet Isaiah. Send me. Send me. Whatever you need, send me. It's your choice. Who, me? Is that you? Who, me? <laughs> God, you got to be joking. Jonah? No, <laughs> no, 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 not me. Are, are you Habakkuk this morning? Why me? Like, pick him. Or can you be the person God needs you to be and simply say these words? Are you ready? Send me. Send me. Send me. God, whatever you're going to do, send me. Watch this and we'll wrap it up. You ready for me? Let's do it. (laughs) (laughs) What are you doing? Glenn, it's New Year's Eve. Gosh. No, it's 8.30. Yeah, well, if I'd woke you up at midnight, you probably wouldn't even have talked to me tomorrow. You know me so well. All right, that was fun. I'm going to bed. Wait. Wait, 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 sit with me. You know we're not going to make it to midnight, Liv. Uh, Look, we can ring in the new year now. Why do I feel like this is some clever disguise to get me into some deep conversation right now? (sighs) Huh? Huh? Well, you know me well. All right, well, it'll be the last serious discussion of the year, so praise (laughs) the Lord. Oh, perfect. I love it. (laughs) No, I don't. It's not. (laughs) But I will listen to you. Do I ever change? Is this one of those questions? It's not a question. No, just I never... <laughs> nothing about me ever changes. I just It's the same old me, it's the same old habits, the same recipe that I got out from the magazine the year we were married and the same New Year's decoration. <laughs> no, you don't need to do that. It's just... <sighs> nothing about me ever changes. You change? Yeah. Sweetheart, you do like 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 your hair. You 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 changed your hair last year. No. Yeah, you, you dyed it. Yes. No. You changed the format or something of it, huh? <laughs> oh, okay, okay. I'm not I'm not into hair, sweetheart. I just you don't get it. <laughs> Tomorrow is going to be a new year, and I'm gonna wake up and be the same person I've been for years. The whole year will go by. Nothing's gonna change. Don't you want to see a change in me? And you, and us, gosh, and anything. Sure. Sure? Yeah. That's it? Liv, I have no idea what I want for this upcoming year. And if there's one thing I do know, I have no idea what you want. That's a wise man. Thank you. 
Here's an idea. Why don't we just pray about it? Wait, wait are you being are you being serious right now? Yes, yes, I'm being serious. <laughs> Why don't you and I, us together, just pray about it? We'll just ask God what he wants for this upcoming year, okay? And we'll just try to listen. <laughs> See, you know me so well. Maybe I call you, hang up? Yeah, sure. Really. <laughs> Heavenly Father, thank you for your love for us. Thank you that you never let us go. Thank you for new chapters. Thank you for love in our heart when she sees the world. Thank you, God, for our tenderness. Thank you, God.